Last week, we studied Hannah's song in 1 Samuel chapter 2. That song came at the beginning of the book of Samuel. And I say the book of Samuel because it's really one book that's kind of been split into two. Uh, You have the same kind of effect with Kings and Chronicles, and that's fine. Uh, But there's a, a lot of interesting things that are happening when you compare Hannah's song with a couple of other songs in Scripture. And I mentioned this last week. Uh, but the one we're going to focus on today is David's song in 2 Samuel 22. So we're going from the beginning of Samuel to the end of Samuel, and that's not an accident. These are going to bookend and frame all of what happens within Samuel. In fact, after hearing last week's lesson and this week's lesson, Uh, You might feel a little inspired to read through Samuel again and to go through that story and see the changes in Israel uh, and some of of this development of the idea of God's anointed. A lot has happened between these two songs, but it's shocking to me how similar they are. I want to examine how they overlap and how the different contexts put them in a new light. Uh, One note that I'll give is that 2 Samuel 22 is replicated almost exactly in Psalm 18. And what I understand from that is that the thoughts here are significant and worthy of special study. Uh, So you can read it in 2 Samuel 22. You can also see almost the exact same thing in Psalm 18, um, which is kind of neat. Next week, we'll continue these thoughts by going to the New Testament in Luke chapter 1 and looking at Mary's Magnificat, Uh, and that should be very enlightening as well as she's going to expand on these thoughts even more. So as an intro, let's read 2 Samuel 22, verses 1 through 4. You will probably want to keep your Bible open to 2 Samuel 22. We're going to be in it, and it's a long chapter. Uh, Hannah's song was 10 verses. This one is 51 verses, so we're going to have to do a little bit more jumping around. I will have verses up on the screen as well, but uh, you might want to keep your Bible open as we study. 2 Samuel 22, verses 1 through 4. And David spoke to the Lord the words of his song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be saved and I am saved from my enemies. We just sang that, didn't we? Uh, There's actually a few songs that come from this song that we end up singing a lot. You might notice them as we study through. I don't know if Alan did that on purpose or not, but it was very fitting to have that in there. The first point I want us to see from this song is that the Lord is my rock. Several times in uh, in the song, David calls God his rock. In verses 2 and 3, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. Notice as well that he says not only rock, but fortress and refuge. Uh, In verses 32 and 33, he says, For who is a God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge. And again, that word refuge pops up. In verse 47, it says, The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. So remember that this idea of God being a rock is something that we saw in Hannah's song as well. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, Hannah said, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. So if you're somebody reading through Samuel and you've read Hannah's song and you get through the whole story of Samuel, the whole story of of Saul and David, but these books explore, 
uh, then hopefully with these things in mind, as you read through David's song, you're already primed to think not just of God being reliable and faithful, but something that is tied to his innate holiness. And, And this is a little bit of a revelation for me. I'm not sure I've connected these ideas as strongly as Hannah and David seem to connect them. We talk about God's faithfulness, God's reliability, the the sturdiness and stability of God, and then we talk about his holiness, how he is high above creation. He has existed uh, since before time. He created time. He created all of creation, and so God is set apart and above everything and everyone. Yet these ideas are not really all that distinct. They are different shades of a very similar concept. God's holiness is distinct from ours, like we mentioned last week. We are holy because God calls us to be holy and we choose to seek after him and we are transformed in in our service to him. But God is holy because there is something innate about him that is different. God did not choose a higher path. God was not called to a higher path. God simply is higher. Definitionally. God is above all of us and all of creation. And it is because of that holiness, it is because of that definitional difference that God is a rock. It is because of that that he can be counted on and relied upon. The the very factors that make us unreliable and make us untrustworthy do not exist with God. Think about it. Why is it that you might disappoint someone or that someone might disappoint you? Well, I might disappoint you if I lie to you. I might disappoint you if I don't have the power to do what I promised. I might disappoint you if I forget what you asked and and forget what I promised you. Are any of these problems for God? Are any of these things that he is subject to? His holiness, his definitional difference from us makes him reliable in a way that even the most reliable person cannot be. We strive for faithfulness. We strive for reliability. God simply is. Another highlight of stability is in verse 31. Where David says this, God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. And so notice as well the connection between God's way being perfect and his word being true to his place as a shield and refuge. So David makes the same kind of connection that Hannah does. And so I don't know about you, but that makes me want to keep reading through scripture And think about all of these instances where God's holiness is talked about and all of these instances where God's faithfulness is talked about and try to tease out more of these connections and more of these ideas. Uh, This this is one, I think, one of the most significant things that I have learned in studying out these songs, how strong this connection is between two facets of God that might seem very different to us. Maybe that's not a revelation to you. Maybe you're wondering how this is, uh, you know, such a connection. But I, I think it's significant. I think there's a lot to to learn here and a lot to appreciate about God. Secondly, we can see that the that David says the Lord is my deliverer. In verses 2 through 4, which we read before, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, the stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Additionally, in verse 28, it says, You save a humble people, But your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. 
In verse 36, you have given me the shield of your salvation, and your gentleness made me great. In verse 44, it says, you delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as the head of the nations, people whom I had not known served me. And then in verses 47 through 51, it says, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me. Who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing praise to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Okay, so we've shotgunned a few verses here as we're, we're seeing a repetition of this idea of the Lord being a deliverer. But I want you to appreciate how much this is expanded from what Hannah talks about, because Hannah addresses this idea too. Hannah overcame her enemies, and she praises the Lord for that. But what was the context of Hannah's problem and Hannah's opposition? Her enemy, primarily, was Peninnah, who tormented her because she could not have children. And God vindicated and delivered Hannah uh, to to show that Peninnah's complaint and, and harassment of her was no longer even valid. And that Peninnah had no standing to make that kind of complaint against her because that's not even something in Hannah's control anyway. The Lord raises up. The Lord drags down as he pleases. And so remember what Hannah says at the beginning of her song. 1 Samuel 2, 1. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. So we started off at a very small point. I don't want to minimize Hannah's problem or to... to take away from the fact that she felt a lot of grief over this. She certainly did. But compared to David's problems, it seems at the very least to be on a smaller scale. Hannah's enemy, Hannah's problem was Peninnah tormenting her. David's problem was, well, he was called to be the next king, and the current king didn't very much appreciate that. The current king tried to kill him. Saul threw his spear at him, tried to hunt him down uh, with great enthusiasm for a long time. Uh, David, when he did become king, fought in many wars. He was a king of war, really, and so he was in constant danger and peril. He had a son who tried to usurp the throne and tried to uh, take that authority from him, which very much puts David's life in danger. And as a king, I'm sure he had many more enemies than are even listed in these books of history for us. So David's problems are pretty large. As bad as things were for Hannah, being tormented by her enemy, David has people hunting him down. David has people who are trying to end his life with prejudice. Yet the Lord delivered him. The Lord was powerful enough and willing to pull him out of that danger and to put him in a safe place. David had many powerful enemies. And even though he is king he is just one man and so he gives a lot of praise and glory to god for the salvation that god has given to him these words deliverance and salvation come up so much all throughout to the song for very good reason another similarity is hannah says my horn is exalted in the lord and we talked about how horn is a symbol of power and strength that Hannah's power and strength have been lifted up because God has solved her problem and has helped her to overcome her enemy. Well, David says uh, that God is the horn of my salvation. 
David very overtly states that it's God who is the power. It's God who has the strength to to make him overcome. And so David's strength to overcome his enemies, he is fully aware, comes from God, not from his own prowess, not from his own uh, you know, legions of men who are willing to serve him and die for him. He knows that it is God. And David has not always known this perfectly. We see examples of him doing some things where he, he loses that trust in God, uh, like when he starts to count the people. He takes the census as a way, really, of stroking his ego and of determining just how mighty his forces are. Uh, and God is not pleased with him. God punishes him and the nation for that. But generally speaking, David knows that it's through God that his salvation comes. He knows he needs God. He knows that it is by God's hand that he is saved. We talked in class this morning about the danger of letting prosperity or success of any kind become an avenue for arrogance, that God knew that the Israelites would do that uh, when they left Egypt, they had been slaves, and now they are enriched. They've plundered the people as they left. They're about to be given a land that is far better than the wilderness that they are traveling through, and far better than Egypt, really. And God says there's going to be this great temptation for you to think that you have done this. Don't let that happen. Don't... you. Know, arrogantly puff yourself up to believe that you are responsible for your blessings. And of course, Israel does exactly that. Uh, God actually says more than there's going to be a great temptation. He knows that they're going to do it. He knows that they're going to fall in this way. And so he keeps guiding them and pushing them away from that arrogance and toward a humble service to him. How much more then for David? David is not one of these lowly people in the crowd. David is king. How many mighty leaders know that they need God? How many people in positions of great authority truly rely on God and know how much they need him? You know, I'm not fit to judge the hearts of men, but... We know human nature. We know how easy it is for us to take small blessings and to make them great avenues for arrogance. Well, what about when one has great power? What about when one has many blessings, great riches, great power, great authority? I think we've seen throughout history, uh, throughout different nations, uh, here and in other places, how easy it is for kings, for leaders, for uh, rulers of the people to become very focused on self, very focused on magnifying their own power and not ruling well. That's a sad thing. If only every leader would be like David and would rely so heavily on God. Thirdly, we see a theme of solid ground. And this is going to build very nicely on the previous point of God delivering David. But David shows how God takes him from the depth of crisis and destruction to a broad and stable place. In verses 5 through 7, it says, For the waves of death encompassed me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cord of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. That verse makes me claustrophobic. <laughs> it is a hard verse to read. Uh, being you know, encompassed by waves of death, being assailed by torrents of destruction, being entangled in cords and snares of death, like start you know, breathing a little faster uh, when you read that kind of verse, and that's not by accident. David knows how much peril he's been in over the years in these different situations where his life hung in the balance. Then as you keep reading, 
you see a description of God moving powerfully to save David, and that's verses 8 through 16. But let's pick up again in verse 17 and see what God does for David. He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. God does not just give David a nudge in the right direction. You know, if David is wrapped up in these cords and and tangles of death, God does not just kind of, you know, cut him free and push him towards safety. God lifts him up out of the water and sets him on a broad place. Sets him on something that is solid, stable, reliable, and most importantly, safe. In verses 33 and 34, this God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. So we're building on this. The the stable place, the broad place that David stands on, it is something that is blameless. It is described as you know being secure on the heights you can imagine a deer they're very light on their feet uh, yet they're very stable you don't really see a deer fall over too often Uh, they're they're stable and they're secure and they can be in these precarious positions yet still have have strength and stability maybe you can imagine Uh, like a mountain goat as well, being up on that secure place where a predator would have trouble even reaching them, yet the mountain goat is secure and strong. That's what God has done for David. He's lifted him up out of that danger, out of that peril and the imminent death, and he's put him secure on the heights, and he's put him in a way of blamelessness. Again, this is an expansion of the theme that began in Hannah's song. We'll get there in a sec. Uh, the theme that began in Hannah's song. Hannah generally talks about the lowly and the poor and the needy being lifted up to a better place, but she doesn't elaborate on it a whole lot. Again, that song is a lot shorter than this one. David ties it more closely into security and establishment contrasted with his prior danger. I think because the stakes are higher for David, it it becomes clearer to see the, the full impact of God rescuing David and where he places him in contrast to the danger he was in before. I want to build on this idea of the blameless way some more because that jumps out at me. and I think there's a lot to talk about there. In uh, you know, Let's consider what David says about this blameless path. There's a bit of a loop to this theme that might be confusing, but I think it's significant. I think there's a lot for us to gain here. Uh, in verses 21 through 23, The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and from his statutes I did not turn aside. Keep going through 27. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. With the merciful you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely, and with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. Verse 28, you save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This might be a little bit confusing. David spends a fair amount of time in this song extolling his own blamelessness and righteousness. And that doesn't immediately seem like it fits. I said that there are several songs that have come out of this 
2 Samuel 22 or Psalm 18 uh, that have made it into our hymnals that you know we sing. Can you imagine singing some of this? Would it feel quite right? Oh God, we are blameless before you. We have no guilt. You have rewarded us according to our righteousness, according to our cleanness in his sight. Like, could you, could you go through a whole song where we're telling God about how good we are? Like, that doesn't feel totally right to me. Yet it's here, and I think the tension that is here can be resolved as we understand what David is, is getting at. There's a loop involved, an iterative loop, uh, that God rescued David because his hands were clean, and his hands were clean because God taught him righteousness. And when God rescued David, it brought him to a place of stability where he could imitate that holiness of God that makes God a rock. Did you, did you follow all that? Like, <laughs> there, was, there was a lot there, but we're, we're kind of going in a bit of a loop. And in fact, we talked a little bit about this in class this morning, and I commented that we'd be talking about that more here uh, in the lesson as we were discussing a little bit of the order of things on whether like obedience makes you spiritual or whether being spiritual makes you obedient. Uh, and you can see it both ways. And I think the reason you can see it both ways is because the two actually loop that they they iterate on each other, that it is because we are spiritual, spiritually minded, we are are interested in God, we want to submit to God, we want to serve him and to seek what he offers. It is because of all that that we obey him. There's no real reason to obey otherwise. Yet it's when we are obedient and start following God that we have this transformative process that God puts us through as we learn to do better. We learn how to, to mold the mind, to mold the heart, to change the way that we think. You know, as, as powerful as your motivations and emotions might be when you first come to Christ, you don't know everything yet. <laughs> you don't have, you know, even all of the appreciation for what God has commanded, for what he does, for what he calls you to be. And the more that you serve him, the more you appreciate why he commands these things. And so my desire to be spiritual leads me to obey. My obedience leads me to better understand and better be transformed in what it means to be spiritual or let's use the word righteous or blameless And that, in turn, helps me to obey better and better. This is all a different way of saying that we constantly grow as Christians, that we constantly are improving and growing closer to God with a greater appreciation and a greater commitment to what he has commanded us. I don't think we can read this section of 2 Samuel 22 and come to the conclusion that David thinks that he is perfect. That David thinks that it is because he is so good, because he is so blameless, so righteous, that God has saved him. That David deserves it. This isn't really about that. And in fact, if you've read through the whole book of Samuel, it's kind of laughable to say that David is truly like literally blameless and that there is nothing in his life he could ever be blamed for. David sins. He does things that he's not supposed to. He turns away from God. He gives in to lusts. He gives in to pride. He gives in to the the selfishness of sin. He has problems and he's struggling to overcome them. Yet David is said to be a man after God's own heart. And I think it's because he's in that loop that he's learning to do better. When he realizes that he has sinned, when he is confronted, when uh, th- then he you know, is refined and does better the next time. He uses it as an opportunity to grow closer to God rather than pull away. 
And so that's what that blameless path is. I think if we can get away from viewing it as a static thing, David saying, I am blameless, therefore God saves me, the end, and instead realize that we're, we're dealing with something a, a kind of fluid, something that involves constant growth and constant transformation. That dovetails really nicely with what New Testament scripture says about what it means to be a Christian, how we have, you know, in, in one sense that we are saved and righteous when we become disciples, when we are baptized. And in another sense, we are never truly righteous because we're always striving to be more like God. And those two things can simultaneously be, be true as long as we understand the, the fluid nature of this. Hannah explores this idea as well. At the end of her song, she says, uh, this is 1 Samuel 2, 9 and 10, he will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces against them. He will thunder in heaven. So Hannah just gives us a taste of this idea that God will guard the feet of his faithful ones, that when we are faithful, when we are seeking the Lord, that he will guard us, he will protect us. But of course, David has expanded on this a lot more uh, in a much deeper explanation. There's another interesting comparison that Hannah uses the, the phrase, you know, thunder in heaven, God will thunder in heaven against the adversaries of the Lord. David also uses the phrase of the Lord thundering from heaven, but in the part that we didn't read, in that section talking about God moving mightily to save him. So I find it interesting that God's power cuts both ways. And again, that fits very well with the rest of Scripture. God's power is terrifying to those who are against him, to those who rebel against him, and it is a blessing and a comfort to those who seek him. No problems there. As a conclusion, let's end on the same point that we ended with Hannah's song, with this idea of God's anointed. Hannah very briefly introduced this idea of God strengthening the king and God giving strength to his anointed. And that was a strange thing for her to say before Israel had any kings. Yet that introduces the concept as we get into the book of Samuel and see the story of how Israel progresses from judges to kings. David's song ends in almost the same way, but with a completely different context. In verse 51, he says, Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So now instead of generically you know, the Lord's king, his king or his anointed that he has set up over Israel, this now has a greater meaning to mean David and his lineage. Uh, we, you know, Hannah was looking forward to the vague notion of a king. David is king, and God has promised that it would be his, his lineage, his descendants, who would reign over Israel for generations to come. Israel has found a good king, and David's line is set to reign over them. There will be rocky moments, obviously, and this will falter eventually in a physical sense. But we'll see a further expansion of this idea next week when we study Mary's Magnificat, that the, the concept of God's anointed is not ultimately about who is reigning over the nation-state of Israel. Like, there's more to it than that. And as somebody who doesn't live in Israel, like that's meaningful to me, that there's an expansion to this that is going to cover the whole world. And when Mary you know, was told that she would give birth to Jesus, the Son of God, like, that brought so much hope and, and, and a promise of power to the world that God's anointed had come to save man. Thank you, brethren. 
I hope this has been interesting and a helpful study for you. We'll continue this next week with Mary's Magnificat and, and wrap up the series there. If there's anything we can do for you, if you're ready to come to Christ in baptism, to become a disciple, uh, we'd be happy to help you with that. If you need to ask for forgiveness of sins, ask for strength, comfort, help, and whatever it is that you are going through, uh, we're happy to help you with that too. Whatever your need is, please come forward as we stand and sign.